The call of Alpha Team, Alpha Team blasts from the PA system of Carnival Triumph, waking the passengers. Among those awakened are a husband and wife traveling with their two kids. The husband opens the door of their cabin and finds the hallway filled with a thick black smoke. In 1972, Ted Arison created Carnival Cruise Line. He was already a wealthy businessman looking for new opportunities. Arison had a clear vision for Carnival Cruise Line. Make cruising fun, affordable and accessible to everyone. So Arison marketed his company as a fun ship experience that attracted a wide range of customers, which led to a massive expansion, becoming the largest cruise operator in the world. Carnival Triumph was built in 1999 at the Fincantieri Yard in Monfalcone, Italy. The ship was one of the Destiny class vessels, the first of its type to exceed 100,000 gross tonnage and setting a new standard for size and amenities in the cruise industry. It has 3,540 passenger berths in 1,379 cabins and 1,118 crew berths. It's built with four decks above the main deck plus seven superstructure decks within the hull. It's 273 meters in length with a width of 36 meters and a gross tonnage of 101,509 tons. In mid-2012, Carnival Cruise Line begins promoting Triumph for a new route set to start in February 2013. The itinerary for the cruise starts from the port of Galveston, Texas, with its primary destination in Cozumel, a popular Caribbean island for its beaches, coral reefs and vibrant local culture off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. The cruise is marketed as a short and fun getaway for families, couples and friends looking for a quick vacation over four nights. Triumph has already been operating for almost 13 years, sailing mostly to the Western Caribbean on seven night cruises. The transition to a three or four night itinerary is part of the changing market for shorter cruises with a quicker turnaround, which puts pressure on the crew to embark and disembark guests more regularly to keep everything running smoothly. Carnival Triumph is equipped with diesel electric propulsion and six main generators. The diesel electric propulsion system generates all electricity for the vessel, including power for the electric motors that propel the ship. It also has six thrusters that it uses for maneuverability when coming in and out of port. Going into February 2013 at the start of the new schedule, only four of the six generators are operating at full capacity. In fact, generator number six is overdue for maintenance, which the crew have noted repeatedly on the vessel's maintenance logs. But Carnival has a new route with a new market segment, and they need to deliver on their promise to their guests. So perhaps they don't have time to take the ship out of operation for major maintenance. Of course, they do make sure that the safety of the ship is prioritized. In fact, they know that the flexible fuel lines in the machinery spaces are at risk because of leaks on other vessels with similar infrastructure. A total of nine fuel leaks in the previous two years. The company instructs their fleets to install spray shields around the flexible fuel lines in the engine rooms. Triumph complies with the instruction, but they don't install spray shields to the fuel line below the deck plates. A deck plate is there to open an access hatch into the machinery. I'm not sure why they don't install a spray shield, but I can imagine it's because it might get in the way of the access that the deck plate provides. Of course, one of the reasons they don't want fuel spraying into the engine room is fire. Triumph has a high fog water spray firefighting system built into the engine spaces of the vessel. This high fog system uses high pressure water which enters the space as a fine fog or mist at high speed which efficiently cools and extinguishes potential dangers like fires and dissipates dangerous gases. On the 7th of February 2013, Carnival Triumph prepares for its departure from Galveston. Waiting in the terminal are 3,143 passengers, all eagerly anticipating the start of their trip, with 1,100 crew members ready to serve them over the next four days. The crew assist with boarding, managing luggage and ensuring the safety procedures are in place. And they oversee the mandatory safety drills for passengers, including lifeboat instructions and emergency protocols. Among the thousands of passengers are couples, families with their kids and groups of friends. After boarding, the guests explore the ship, taking photos as they go. 
they find multiple dining options ranging from formal dining rooms and buffets to a la carte restaurants. There are themed bars including the Alchemy Bar, Red Frog Rum Bar and the Blue Iguana Tequila Bar. The ship has a large theatre for Broadway style shows, a casino and several lounges with live music and other entertainment. There are two main outdoor pools, one with a retractable roof, whirlpools and water slides. There's even a mini golf course. Passenger accommodation ranges from interior staterooms to suites and ocean view cabins. The interior staterooms don't have windows, but 38% of them have a private balcony. The ocean view rooms have large windows or portholes and the luxury suites offer more space and luxury amenities. Late that afternoon, Carnival Triumph departs Galveston while the passengers settle in and enjoy the amenities the ship has to offer. Adults relax and talk at the pool while their kids play in the water. Others try their luck in the casino and couples relax in the bars and lounges. Crew members briskly provide service ensuring a smooth experience as they set sail. Dinner is served in the main dining rooms and specialty restaurants. Then guests take in the evening entertainment of theater shows and comedy performances. The next morning, the 8th of February, passengers start their day with a breakfast buffet and enjoy the sea breeze and the smell of the ocean. After breakfast, some guests take fitness classes while others enjoy spa treatments and poolside games. At midday, lunch is served together with cooking demonstrations. The adults are getting their money's worth and the children on board spend their time in the arcade, game rooms and the pool. That evening, Carnival Triumph holds a formal night with special dinner menus. The passengers enjoy the night as the ship heads for Mexico. On the morning of the 9th of February, Carnival Triumph berths in Cozumel and the passengers disembark to explore what the beautiful Caribbean island has to offer. The crew uses this time to prepare the vessel for its voyage back to Galveston. They plan the evening activities for when their guests return mid-afternoon. By 16.30, Carnival Triumph is ready to depart Cozumel and start its journey back home. The passengers return to the onboard activities, enjoy their dinner and the evening entertainment. In the early hours of the 10th of February, the ship's crew conduct routine checks. At 0330, the second engineer arrives in the engine room to begin his 0400 to 0800 watch. It's his responsibility to assess and report anything out of the ordinary in the engine room and perform a standard set of checks and routines. He sends the third engineer, a cadet, and an oiler to the air conditioning compressor room to carry out maintenance. At 0345, the oiler arrives in the engine room and after receiving a handover from the previous watch oiler, performs a routine check of the engine room. At 0350, the cadet arrives in the engine control room. At 0435, the oiler makes his rounds and inspects number six engine in the aft engine room where he doesn't notice anything unusual. At 0516, the second engineer gets a call from the bridge. The fire alarm from diesel generator number six has been triggered. The second engineer radios the third engineer to ask him to investigate. The third engineer, along with the cadet and oiler, leave the air conditioning compressor room and head to the aft engine room. As they approach, the third engineer smells fuel and when they enter, he sees fuel spraying from engine number six. It's coming up from beneath the deck plates to a height of six meters between the engine's turbochargers. At 0519, they activate the manual emergency stop for diesel generator number six. Five minutes later, the third engineer, oiler and cadet head to the fuel oil separator room where they close the fuel supply valve for engine number five and number six. At 0525, the cadet leaves the fuel oil separator room to check the aft engine room. When he gets back to the engine room, he sees the engine burst into flames. He turns around and runs to the engine control room to report the fire to the second engineer. At 0527, the high fog firefighting system activates automatically. The second engineer makes a call to the chief engineer to report the fuel leak and fire. A minute later, the first officer sees flames coming out of the engine room and makes an alpha team call which booms out over the ship's PA system for everyone on board to hear. Alpha team is the code for a fire emergency. 
The guests on the first and second deck smell smoke as it seeps into the hallways and passengers in the pool area can see thick black plumes rising into the air from the top deck. The captain goes to the wheelhouse where he hears the Alpha Team announcements. The chief engineer scrambles down the 100 steps from deck 8 and races to the engine control room where the second engineer is already checking the high fog control panel. He confirms that the high fog system has deployed for diesel generator number 6. Power from generator 6 fluctuates and then dies off completely. All the control panel lights go out and the second engineer shuts down all the generators. The chief engineer arrives in the engine control room and takes over from the second engineer. On the bridge, the staff captain, the cruise director and the environmental officer are on the 0400 to 0800 watch. As the staff captain and first officer update the captain, they see flames on the CCTV monitor. The chief engineer calls the bridge, advising the captain that they're in a serious situation and requests permission to release CO2 to put out the fire. The captain agrees, but insists a roll call must be carried out first. If there's anyone trapped in the machinery space when the carbon dioxide system is deployed, they will likely be asphyxiated and die. The engineering roll call board is located in a hallway outside the engine control room. Each person must leave their ID badge on the hook when entering the engine room. There are two badges on the board. The chief engineer dispatches teams to confirm that the engine room is secure before they release the CO2. He makes sure that the doors to the garbage handling room are closed and that no crew members are in this area because the garbage handling room is in the same CO2 zone as the aft engine room. He then heads to the CO2 remote activation cabinets which are directly outside the engine room. He sounds the CO2 alarm and confirms the fire doors and dampers are closed and sealed. The CO2 system in the aft engine room doesn't activate. He heads up the stairs to deck number 11 to the CO2 room. On the way, he notices that the lights on the ship are starting to flicker. The CO2 alarm is flashing outside the CO2 bottle storage room, which means that CO2 is filling the room, making it unsafe to enter. The CO2 room is next to the emergency generator room where the senior electronics officer and first engineer are stationed. The chief engineer sends the chief refrigeration engineer to confirm that the fire dampers above the aft engine room are closed. CO2 won't be released if the dampers aren't sealed. The refrigeration engineer confirms that all dampers and the garbage room fire doors are closed. The electronics officer puts on a breathing apparatus and enters the CO2 room where he sees that the lights are on but that the red light for the release valve is not lit. He discovers one of the CO2 bottles is leaking and a second bottle has a loosely closed cap. He requests permission to manually release the CO2. He gets the green light and tries to turn the main distribution valve. The valve is under pressure and takes some force to turn. The stem lifts, relieving the pressure and the CO2 is successfully deployed. As he exits the CO2 room, he sees white smoke in the passage. Moments later, the smoke is gone. On the bridge, the safety officer and the captain debate whether to open the internal doors between deck zero and the aft mooring station so they can vent smoke from the marshalling area and the engine control room. Smoke is already entering passenger decks in the stern of the ship. The passengers still have no idea what's going on because the crew haven't made any more announcements since the Alpha Team message in the PA system. Some passengers are already searching for life jackets and trying to find their family and friends. In a state of panic and fearing the worst, hundreds of passengers squeeze up against each other in the evacuation center. On deck number zero, directly above the aft engine room, the crew start to cool the area surrounding the engine room by spraying a mist of water to reduce the heat escaping from the fire. When water is heated and turns to steam, the gas expands by 1,600 times compared to the volume of water. The crew use fire hoses to spray the bulkheads in short bursts to reduce the heat. If they open the fire hose and spray continuously, the superheated water will turn to steam and expand through the enclosed spaces of the ship, boiling the crew as if they were stuck in a pressure cooker. The chief engineer, staff engineer and cadets go back to the engine control room. 
the electronics and safety officers put on breathing devices and enter the forward engine room to inspect all the areas that surround the aft engine room. This includes the forward engine room, main switchboard rooms and propulsion motor room. The safety officer uses a laser thermometer to monitor the bulkheads for hotspots. The forward and aft bulkheads of the aft engine room are stable at 50 degrees Celsius and he takes readings as high as 220 degrees Celsius in spots most affected by the fire. The staff chief engineer runs a temporary power line from the propulsion motor room to the high fog system to give it power and bring it back into service. 30 minutes after the initial Alpha Team announcement, the captain addresses the passengers. He orders people in the evacuation area to return to their cabins and staterooms immediately and informs them that a situation has occurred in the engine control room but that everything is under control. Soon after the announcement, the ship's lights flicker and then the ship plunges into darkness. Then the propulsion system winds down as the motors lose power. Now, I'm a little torn. On the one hand, it's good to listen to the captain and crew. It certainly makes their life easier if passengers listen to instructions. But if you've seen my video on SeaWorld, which I'll link here, then you might not trust everything the crew tell you. If I see smoke and then the lights go out and the ship's engines lose power, I wouldn't go back to my cabin. I'd find a nice spot out on the deck as high up as possible. By 0608, the fire in the engine room is contained by the crew but with no power on the ship, 3,143 passengers and 1,100 crew members are stranded in the middle of the ocean. The captain and his officers devise a plan. They coordinate with two tugboats to tow Carnival Triumph to the port of Progreso, Mexico, which should take two days. While the initial danger from the fire has passed, the situation on the ship leaves the passengers restless. With all the power out, Many basic utilities are unavailable. The elevators aren't working and the air conditioning has shut down, creating an uncomfortable, humid climate. There's no running water and the pumps in the septic tank system fail. So passengers can't use the toilets in their cabins. There are only five public bathrooms in operation for over 4,000 people, which quickly become clogged up from such a high volume of use. An announcement is made over the PA system to say that staff members will deliver red biohazard waste bags to the cabins and that passengers must defecate into the bags. The bags must then be placed in the corridor outside the cabin and passengers must pee in their shower. Not exactly what you want to hear on a fun cruise with your friends. Some passengers don't eat in an attempt to avoid using the red bags. Others, well, when nature calls. Red bags and a foul smell fills the corridors throughout the ship. To make matters worse, without power, the vessel's stabilizers aren't doing their job. So the ship rolls slowly on the ocean. Walking the halls, passengers have to hold the handrails to keep their balance and sewage splashes out the clogged toilets, spilling into the cabins and onto the decks. Sewage and red bags flow through the hallways and corridors. Water and waste backed up in the drains overflows, soaking the carpet floors in the ship. To escape the overflowing waste, guests carry their mattresses onto the outside decks and use blankets to build makeshift tents. The foul odor and blistering heat make for a tense atmosphere on board the vessel. During meals, some passengers are caught hoarding food, heightening the tensions on board. After an unbearable night, the passengers are told that Carnival Triumph will get help from two of its sister ships, Carnival Legend and Carnival Conquest. While Carnival can't transfer passengers to another ship, they can provide much needed supplies and provisions. Later, on the morning of the 11th of February, Carnival Legend pulls alongside Triumph. Legend is a fully functional ship with passengers having a great time, in stark contrast with the conditions on board Triumph. Accompanying Carnival Legend is a US Coast Guard vessel which offers assistance. To keep their passengers occupied, Triumph's crew try their best to lighten the mood with some onboard entertainment. Using the emergency generator, the crew are able to host some movie marathons in the theater. Passengers form small groups playing guitar or card games to pass the time. The toilet situation doesn't improve. The red medical waste bags are the only option for the 4,000 passengers. 
One of the passengers on board Triumph is a day late for dialysis. So the Coast Guard transports her to the Carnival Legend, which is bound for Miami. At 1500, the two tugboats arrive. But the captain is told that Progresso is no longer the nearest port and the decision is taken to dock the ship in Mobile, Alabama. To calm the passengers and celebrate the tug's arrival, the captain tells the guests the ship will operate an open bar from mid-afternoon till evening with unlimited beer and wine. Some guests take advantage of the free-flowing alcohol, then get rowdy and let their frustration out on the ship. In a drunken state, some of the passengers pee and spit on the restroom floors, adding to the mess the ship's already in. Others throw paper cups and plates around the bar and into the water. The open bar is closed after two hours. By the morning of the 12th of February, Carnival Triumph has been drifting at sea for two days. The vessel has been towed 78 nautical miles at a speed of six knots, with 210 nautical miles to go until reaching Mobile. 35 hours to go. With new provisions from Carnival Legend, mealtimes improve for everyone on board. There's more variety of food and the crew can serve everyone efficiently. But the ship continues to roll without its stabilizers and the sewage situation deteriorates with urine washing back up out of the showers and spilling over into the cabins. The crew lay out cardboard on the corridor floors so passengers can walk safely but the cardboard is soon soaked through. On the 13th of February, Carnival Triumph has 110 nautical miles to go before it reaches Mobile. During the morning, the crew inform the passengers that two helicopters will land on the stern deck with engineers who will try to troubleshoot the diesel electric motors and hopefully restore power to the ship. The passengers need to remove their makeshift tents to allow the helicopters to land. As the choppers approach, a crowd gathers to watch their arrival. The engineers work through the night and are able to restore some power to the ship's elevators and sewage system, which, to everyone's relief, gets the toilets working. On the 14th of February, the two tugboats pulling Triumph strain against strong winds. To make up some lost ground, two additional tugboats join forces to tow Carnival Triumph, and an additional tug is put on standby. Finally, after four days on board their shitty cruise ship, they dock in Mobile at 2120, and at 2200, the passengers start to disembark. Jerry Cahill, the CEO of Carnival Cruise Line, meets the passengers as they disembark the ship to personally apologize to them for what they've been through. To make amends for what the passengers endured during the cruise, Carnival refund and reimburse them for the entire cost of their trip. They booked flights for passengers and scheduled buses to return passengers to their homes. As a gesture of goodwill, they also gave each passenger $500 for any damages or injuries during the cruise. The Bahamas Maritime Authority was the lead investigative agency because Carnival Triumph was registered in the Bahamas. Their reports indicated that the fire was caused by a leak in a flexible fuel oil return line fitted to the number no. six diesel engine which allowed fuel to spill onto a hot surface and ignite. Triumph set sail with only four of the six generators fully operational. Generator number six, where the fire started, was overdue for maintenance, and not all fuel lines were shielded. Carnival argued that this was out of the scope of the safety standards at the time. Passengers began a lawsuit against the company, and Carnival Cruises settled an additional $118,500 split between all passengers, roughly $30 per passenger. In 2019, Carnival Triumph underwent a $200 million refurbishment. After the refit, it was renamed Carnival Sunrise. Mm -hmm.